So then you've got the next track down, that medium track, that block track. That's kind of the middle of the bell curve track. That's really what most of my clients do. Most of my clients are going to come in and they're going to have one primary deadlift day where they're going to deadlift heavy first and back off sets for the enough volume next on the same workout. And they're going to have another day where they do a supplemental lift. And it's going to be, it's going to be based on their weakness, based on the thing they need to work on. And I think that tends to work. That's that block model. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Nikki Sims here with your very trusted Barbell Logic man himself. <laughs> Matt Reynolds. <laughs> um, today, howdy. howdy. Today, we're going to talk about something that I have actually really wanted to ask Matt, which is which deadlift track is right for you. And by that, I mean which path are you going to take on your deadlift when things need some change? There seem to be a lot of different things you can do. You can moderate the frequency pretty significantly. Some people will make progress with deadlifting once a week. You can have a lot of variation between the excess or the, between the supplemental deadlifts, between a regular heavy deadlift and an RDL where the stress is just significantly different and a lot of variation in the rep ranges. So I'm curious, and I would love to know from Matt, because I think he's done a really good job with me and being selfish here with my deadlift, how he chooses what he's going to do with his clients. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that we have to do is d talk a little bit about what are the different tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many different deadlift tracks are there? Deadlift is kind of interesting because it's probably different than the other lifts because it is really hard to recover from. Yeah. It's probably the hardest thing to recover from. And so when I think about, before we talk about how we choose the track, by the way, when I think about tracks, like going on tracks, I took a um, anthropology class in college you know, where you study a specific people group or people groups. Mm -hmm. And it just, this is this would have been back in like the late 90s. I studied the Japanese culture. And in their education, in their public education, they put kids on a track, on an educational track, right? So mm -hmm. from a pretty early age, like fifth grade, sixth grade, not really young, but like, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, they start to put kids on a track where the kids who, you know, have the most academic success in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, essentially are, are on a track to go to the best high schools and go to the best colleges and mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And the kids who maybe show more promise in, um, in working with their hands or, you know, that sort of thing would be put on a different track, a track mm -hmm. that, that, again, I think that probably culture would maybe look at that as not quite as great of a track. But I think as time goes on, we see that uh, being on a track to become, to learn a trade to become a plumber or electrician or HVAC or that's a great track. Oh yeah. It's important and useful. And you don't end up with $200,000 in student loans. What a concept. That way. So yeah. that's another option. And so, so when I think of the word track, I kind of think of that same sort of scenario where, okay, we're trying to figure out what deadlift track works for our clients. Mm -hmm. And so let's go through what I think the tracks are. And I'm, obviously there's permutations of each of these and probably things between, but I, I think I can really identify, I was just thinking about this a minute ago, three primary deadlift tracks. Mm. So the first one would be the very high intensity, the heavy, heavy, and very low volume slash frequency deadlift track. Mm -hmm. So usually it's like a, a, a high intensity session where it's really heavy, maybe to a top set of a, of a single, a double, triple, top set of five. Like that's, that is the volume on the high intensity day. That's it. Mm -hmm. Probably no back off sets, just heavy. And then there's usually a lighter day that's like a speed work day. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the what I would call the West Side model. This is the model that Louis Simmons invented or or really did. And I, I don't think they deadlift with such a low frequency now, but there were times when West Side was really making their West Side powerlifting from West Side Barbell Club in Columbus, Ohio was making their sort of rise to to fame and power in the early 2000s. They were like, "Yeah, we deadlift like once every 6 to 10 weeks." Wow. Literally, that's what they said. Wow. What but they did a lot of good mornings, like heavy good mornings and things like that. So very low frequency, very high intensity. Mm -hmm. That would be one track. And it might not be as 
as um, as extreme as that change. In yeah, that's a like little maybe extreme, it's once right? Every two but, weeks, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, or even 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 training once heavy once a week, but just doing way not very much volume on that day, mm-hmm. and significantly reduce volume on any other days that you might pull. Um, the the second track I would think about is the the moderate slash high intensity, like it's pretty high intensity, something between moderate and high, and moderate volume slash frequency, which would really be like the block model. So not the Barbell Logic Online Coaching model block, but the Russian, Russian block, B L O C K. Although it might have been C there too, if we're talking. About yeah. Is that how you spell the communist version of block? I think so. You don't want to have any extra letters. Those aren't doing anything helpful. No, definitely not. No, definitely just not. taking up resources. That's right. And so that model tends to be a, um, you might hit a heavy top set on the main deadlift day, again, of something like a one to five rep top set, mm-hmm. but some back off sets for some additional volume, you know, two, three sets of three to five reps, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. And then you're usually going to have another day where you do a supplemental lift for the deadlift, something like a deficit deadlift that you often has a fair amount of volume. It might be something like five sets of four yeah, or a rack pull or an RDL or some sort of supplemental lift where that's usually specifically attacking a weakness. Mm. So that would be track two. Mm-hmm. And then the third track I would say is the, the moderate intensity, high frequency, and moderate volume per session. Although if you look at because of the high frequency, it's kind of a high volume model. And that is really what I would call the DUP model. And so usually that would have something like a strength deadlift workout per week, which might be like three sets of five or even three sets of AMRAP at fairly high intensity, 85%, 88%, something like that. A power workout for deadlift, which would be, it would start at, by looking like the West Side speed model. So it might be like six sets of three or six sets of two, short rest, you know, every minute on the minute or every 90 seconds or something like that. Do you ever do a variation yes. for that speed work, like a deficit or a I don't, chains? but I do use, yes, I do do, I do use accommodating your resistance. So I do use chains and bands sometimes, sometimes against bands, sometimes with reverse band mm-hmm. and sometimes with chain. I, I like that for for that work. But then as time goes on and you push through the cycle, that quote unquote speed work becomes less speedy and it also has less volume. So it might eventually get to like five sets of one, four sets of one, three sets of one. And by the time I'm getting up there, it's definitely no variation. It's definitely Mm -hmm. exactly the competitive version of the lift. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing a belt. I've got, you know, I'm pulling with a deadlift bar or something like that. I remember doing some of these speed speed deadlifts and I was like, these are not speedy. These <laughs> that's right. <laughs> these that's feel right. like RMs. Still kinda, <laughs> yeah, they're kind of called like they're really called power days. So yeah, the power day. Right. So you've got kind of a strength day, a power day, and then you've got kind of a hypertrophy day um, on that DUP model, a third deadlift day where you definitely could use a supplemental movement. You might just do something like deadlift for three sets of eight or two sets of eight. It's relatively high volume, especially reps per set. But you also might do something like a straight leg deadlift or Romanian deadlift, something that you can kind of get higher volume work in. Super light. And so those are really, yeah. So those are really the three tracks. So you got the kind of high intensity, low volume model, the kind of middle, which is the West side model, the middle of the road model. So moderate, high intensity, moderate, you know, frequencies twice a week. Volume is sort of moderate. And then you've got the high frequency. I'm going to deadlift three times a week. I have to obviously sort of wave my volume and wave my intensity to be able to get the right stuff. But you've got basically a, a, a hypertrophy session in there, a strength session, and a power session. And so those are really the three tracks. Mm-hmm. And unlike much of the other programming for the lifts, I don't know that it that you follow kind of from one track to the next to the next as you become more advanced. I don't right. think you re- necessarily make minimum effective dose changes to and cross the tracks. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't ever end up on a different track than you are. But I think for the most part, you end up on kind of a track that works for you. And for most of your lifting, will stay on that track. Yeah. What do you think are the characteristics of a lifter that would make them be successful at one track and maybe not another? Yes. That's a wonderful setup question that I assumed was coming. (laughs) (laughs) So, So... like we're a team. So th- yeah, so um so I think that demographic plays a huge role in this, mm-hmm. right? So 
I think the lifter sex plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the more testosterone you have and the more ability do you have to that you have to recruit muscle fiber, often, as long as all of that testosterone is is endogenous testosterone, not exogenous testosterone, so not in, inserting into uh, the muscle belly of your butt cheeks uh, <laughs> <laughs> via a vial, uh, then you tend to have a harder time recovering from the deadlift and you might be more towards the west side, low volume end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And so what I found is higher testosterone, larger men, which often those coincide with each other, right? So guys that maybe look like me, big, hairy, balded, bearded, strong, old dudes. Do well on that. <laughs> Hello, Do all well of our on that. <laughs> Yes, right. Hello, 87% of the listeners from Barbara Logic. No, um, you know, I, I think I think you you'll tend those those types of people and the more of those qualifications you have, the the more chance you are going to lift in that sort of low frequency, mm -hmm. relatively low volume, pretty damn heavy. And also I think that strength levels and advancement has a lot to do with that, mm -hmm. right? So the stronger you are, which doesn't always necessarily mean that you are an advanced lifter, but definitely if you're strong and advanced, mm -hmm. right? You cannot make progress or add weight to the bar every workout or every week, but now you're adding weight to the bar, you know, every two, three, four, six weeks. And you're pretty strong. You deadlift. I mean, honestly, we could probably actually assign a load here and it, it would obviously dep depend on the 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 um, body size of the person. But like if you're deadlifting over 600 pounds, there's a greater and greater chance that you're going to be one of these high intensity, low volume people. Mm -hmm. Not guaranteed. Definitely if you're a 275 pound plus male 40 year old deadlifter who deadlifts over 600 pounds, you're almost certainly going to be on this track. Mm -hmm. And I know we have listeners who are going to be like, well, I'm three of those five things. Well, you, then you're not sure. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm. So then you've got the next track down, that medium track, that block track. And that's, I think, that's kind of the middle of the bell curve track. That's really what most of my clients do. Most of my clients are going to come in and they're going to de they're going to deadlift. This is this is more, you know, as we get down this track, everybody starts to an LP, right? And so everybody deadlifts kind of every session. And then you get to point you deadlift every other session. When we get kind of past that spot, this is where we start to see the track come in. For most of my clients, they're going to have one primary deadlift day where they're going to deadlift heavy first and back off sets for the enough volume next on the same workout. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have another day where they do a supplemental lift. And it's going to be it's going to be based on their weakness, based on the thing they need to work on. So that supplemental lift again, like a deficit deadlift or a or a rack pull or a Romanian deadlift or a chain deadlift or a reverse band deadlift or any of those things would work. And the volume on that supplemental day is usually fairly high. And over time, as you get closer and closer to a meet or to trying to set a PR and performance, just like everything else, the volume is going to come down a little bit and the intensity is going to go up a little bit. So eventually you might do a rack pull mm -hmm. to a max single or a top triple or something, but you're not going to start that way. And I think that tends to work. That's that block model. And then the third is that high volume model. And I think for, for if you think about it, it's really sort of the opposite of, from a demographic standpoint, the opposite of the first group. So females... Uh, lower testosterone guys, smaller body weight people, people who weigh on, you know, men who weigh under 220 pounds, women who weigh under 160, 165. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of variation based on height and whatnot. So you're just, you're just kind of blanketed statements. Younger people, people that have the recovery, higher recovery ability. Again, not something that we really deal with or talk about or promote in any way, shape or form. But Lifters who would use performance enhancing drugs and have uh, a higher recovery ability might have the ability to lift with more frequency. That's all there is to it. And not necessarily now that the advancement and the strength level, the, here's the interesting thing. The advancement and the strength level, I don't think plays as big of a role. So what I've noticed is that really strong 198 pound guys can still tend to, I mean, guys that are 198 and have a 600 pound deadlift, so a three X body weight deadlift can still tend to deadlift with higher frequency than the 275 pound guy that has a 700 pound deadlift. And I don't necessarily know why that is, but I, I think that's true. Hmm. I have another question. What about people who have a pretty significant discrepancy between their squat and their yeah. deadlift? So, or when their squat and their deadlift are very similar. And I'm thinking about someone like Carl Shute, whose deadlift and squat are like 
yep. pretty much the same. So they're, they have, they would have, you know, double the amount of days during the week when they're moving a similar load. So would you put them on a certain track because of like, w- like Carl shoot is like, well, you're going to squat and deadlift about 550 <laughs> right. pounds for each. Yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> and then someone who's like squatting, you know, half of what yep. they're deadlifting. Yeah. So if you take a person like a Carl shoot who squats and first off is built to squat, usually a longer torsoed person, mm-hmm. shorter femur, and they're going to have similar, the s- similar weight that they're going to lift. You'll also notice that a person like that, their, their deadlift looks more like a squat. In the bottom yeah. of their deadlift, mm-hmm. they're they're not below parallel, like a below parallel squat, but they're a lot closer to parallel than somebody like you would be on a deadlift. Like your hips are very high and your knees are very extended at the start of a deadlift. A guy like Carl who's got short legs and long torso, his his knees are bent at a 90 degree angle somewhere in that ballpark on a deadlift. Yeah. He looks like the guy that they draw on all the boxes that tell you how to lift. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. <laughs> the lift with your legs, not with your back guy. Uh, that's exactly yeah. who he is. So for him, he's probably going to squat with a little higher frequency because he can, because it's more efficient. Mm. And he would probably deadlift with a little less frequency because it's less efficient and it looks a lot like his squat. So, so he'll get some carryover from his squat to his deadlift more than you will. And he'll get some carryover from his, to his squat from his deadlift. We can't hammer both Mm -hmm. with high frequency because they're just too similar. And so if the primary strength mover, as you start to think about that for a guy like Carl, if it tends to be squat, you're probably going to back off on the frequency a little bit on deadlift. So he's probably going to deadlift more in that block style, probably, that block style. And Carl has lost a ton of weight over the last several years, so he's very lean. He doesn't weigh 270 anymore. You know, he's a, what is he, 230 or something. So he's a lean 230. And so, mm-hmm. you know, he can he can have some frequency in there, but not uh, not too much. So if he went back up to 270, which he won't, but if he did, he would probably be more on that West Side style, lift really heavy once a week, speed work another time a week. Now, mm-hmm. on the other end of the spectrum is somebody like you. You're not built to squat at all. You are built to deadlift. And so your squat is really training for the squat and the squat only. It certainly has some systemic effects for you, but it's not very efficient. Long legs, short torso, have to bend over a lot. Knees get very closed on the squat for you. And so you're going to squat to drive up the squat, but really probably the best prime strength driver for someone like you who is tall, lean, long-legged, short torso is going to be the deadlift. And so that's why one of the things we found, we should probably say, is that we found over time is that you tend to do better with high frequency deadlifts. Now you can't lift high frequency deadlifts super heavy three times a week, but we're doing a similar thing to what we talked about. It would be like a heavy deadlift, you know, or even like what we might call a power deadlift with like low volume, low reps, Mm -hmm. one to three reps, high sets, a day that is more of that sort of three sets of five, three sets of four, four sets of four kind of strengths piece. And then usually for you, it might be like an RDL or something for your, for your hypertrophy piece. And so you can you can do that right. as the main because deadlift I think for you is sort of the main systemic strength driver for your body. And then we had to be mindful with squat programming, and I think this is important too for people who are built similar to me with where they have to lean over a lot. Is like when you have that much moment on your back, you know, you're training with a whole lot more moment than maybe That's right. other people would. So squatting with three times a week might just be like a whole bunch. If you're deadlifting three times a week and you're squatting three times a week, that's a lot of training on your back. And so there might be the argument there that maybe someone would do better squatting only twice a week in order to preserve like the training effect or make sure it's the right amount for the back. For sure. So we we found that you can deadlift three times a week, but you can't squat three times a week. And you definitely can't do both at the same time. And I, I think that's actually a fair argument as well for people who are advanced i think i think that five slots a week between the squat and the deadlift Mm -hmm. for most people Mm -hmm. is sort of the top end it's hard to do six slots a week now if you're again if you're a pretty athletic person you're pretty lean some of your slots are things like you're an olympic lifter as well so some of your pull slots are like clean or snatch and some and one of your squats is a front squat it's just not as it's not as mm-hmm. um, stressful, mm-hmm. I think, that you can do. I've got Andrew Jackson doing that right now. He's basically pulling three times a week and squatting three times a week. But a couple of those sessions aren't very hard. I mean, they're, they're quite a bit. You don't have any deadlift sessions that aren't very hard. Even your hypertrophy right. session is pretty That's hard. How I want it. Yes. But 
yeah. then you would like your squat <laughs> sessions to be as easy as possible. <laughs> oh yeah. I want it to be like, like it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. When you think about, um, you know, and that's, that's another thing that I'll use is just that recovery as, as clients talk to me about their recovery. If they're like, look, I can't, my back is just not recovered from two days ago. Well, then we got to back the frequency off. Right. And, you know, we talk a lot about yeah. three times a week deadlifting versus two times a week. You can just as easily go three times a week, one week, two times a week, the next week, three times, and then you're near two and a half. You can also go one time a week for those big, strong, heavy guys, one time a week, one week, and the next week you pull twice, and then once, and then twice. So, yeah. and that's, and you then, know, you got that 1.5 times, which is fine. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that you can only do with deadlifts. Like no other lift would do well if you did that. Maybe super heavy yeah. squatters. Or, or there are times I'll squat three times a week and two times a week, but not one and mm -hmm. two. It's just not enough. It's yeah. pretty rare that you meet yeah. somebody who needs to squat less than twice a week. And of yeah. course, press and bench press, the interesting thing about that is that tends to be more like five sessions to me is sort of like the low end of pressing and bench pressing, mm -hmm. you you will often end up with, at minimum, a press and bench day, a bench and press day, and then a third day on your lower body day where you do one of those movements. And that f and all your accessories. And all your accessory movements, that's right, where you're doing dips and rows yeah. and all that other kind of stuff. So right. I have lots of clients that bench three times and press three times, so they do six. But I think yeah. that you're getting in that realm that mm -hmm. you can kind of see it's a little less. I also think deadlift in general, this is just kind of a, I don't know if I've said this in the podcast before, I probably have, is that for me, the deadlift volume per workout tends to be one set less than it is for everything else. So for example, if the strength mm, movement is yeah. three sets of five for squat, bench press, and press, it's probably two sets of five for deadlift. If it's four sets of five for all the other lifts, it'll be three sets of five. It's usually one set less because of just the recovery ability difference. And so we've just found that you just don't, mm -hmm. not only do you not need more volume, but that it's actually probably detrimental at some point. By the way, it sucks to have to yeah. deadlift like five sets of five or five sets of six. You're just like, oh, this is, it's not n nearly as bad or, as the other lifts. Yeah. I mean, the other lifts are not, <laughs> you, you get and it. I, yeah, I get it. <laughs> and I wouldn't, I tend to never program AMRAPs on right. deadlifts. I don't either. So, yeah, like I have a lot of people on 531, and I'm just yeah. like, nope, you're not doing it. It's funny, though. I actually do MRAPs <laughs> less, program MRAPs less on squat. Because I'm like, I don't know. Mm. Like, the thing about a deadlift is if they're doing an MRAP and they get to a rep that's just like, this is really hard, and I don't know if I'm going to get it, they can just put the thing down or drop it. <laughs> Prefer you not to drop it. But on a squat, I don't like, listen, how, yeah. how many missed squats do you see as an online coach in a year? I don't see very many. Gosh, actually, like how often do you see somebody bail anymore. on a squat? But how many times do you see somebody hit a set of four deadlifts and they're supposed to hit five and they start to pull the fifth and they're like, nah, I set it down. Mm -hmm. I see three of those a week. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't, I don't ever <laughs> see squats like that. And then bench and press are the same way, right? Especially press. Like yeah. press is always an AMRAP. Have, like I AMRAP everybody on press because I'm just like, well, that's press is a, oh press not in itself. I feel like maybe just yeah, press that's in right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, no, I program it that way because I'm just like, but you're not going to drop it on your head yeah. and you're either like, you get it or you don't, you yeah. put, you know, and you rack it when you can't get it. And, and it's going to be okay. Like the only thing you have to overcome, you don't have to overcome some like physical effect. You just have to overcome the mental effect of, oh, I missed that's another right. rep. That's God right. damn it. And actually that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, I think an important point is that for people who are, <laughs> I want to say mentally stable, that's probably not the right <laughs> For, for people who not are more me. confident and like, and it's not, I mean, listen, you're, you're honestly, you're twice a lifter than I, than I am for sure. But I don't care about missing. It doesn't bother me. When you look at the same thing, like in a, in a yeah. meet, when you go to a meet, you need to go eight for nine or nine for nine, or you're like upset about it. I'd go five for nine, hit a PR and be like, I'm golden. I, I couldn't care less. I would love to pass on most of my third attempts. That's what I want to do. I want to hit PR on number yeah. two. Okay. Grind it enough to walk over to the table and be like, pass on number three. And yep. most people, most, yeah, Drop and it mic. just, it doesn't bother me to miss lifts at all. I don't want to miss a squat. I think, actually, I think I've only missed one squat in my whole, I've had some red lights for depth, but I've, I've only missed one squat in all my years of ever competing where like I had to get saved, like they were catching me and pulling me out. It's oh, only wow. happened once. And mm -hmm. so, um, 
yeah, I think that's part of it too. As you're as you're programming this stuff, yeah. you have to think as a coach how to help your lifter have success mm -hmm. in the gym. And some of my lifters don't need it. They can miss. They don't care. It's a bad day. They can chalk it up. Right. Ah, just everything felt a little weird. No big deal. And then other people sort of come apart at the seams when they start to miss lifts. And so you've got to make yeah. sure that you you program a little more conservatively for them. But but yeah, that that's typically how I do that mm -hmm. track. You just you know the bigger you are, usually more male and um, inability to recover well and often usually strong in advance, they're going to probably deadlift with less with less frequency and less volume. And the smaller yeah. you are, I think I think body weight really plays a huge role in this. Because I, I think about, I've got a handful of clients that are really strong and not very big, and they can deadlift with high frequency. It's interesting. But those, gosh, those, those guys that weigh close to 300 pounds, they just can't. And they do tons of volume. It's not that they can't. I mean, I've got guys that are way close to 300 pounds are still, right. I mean, cardiovascularly even, they're in great shape. They'll do strongman stuff at the end. But you can even think about a strongman. Like strongmen who are competing in pro strongman, they can't deadlift three times a week. But those guys deadlift a thousand. No. Well, who's the strongest deadlifters in the world? Everybody in the world's strongest man is stronger than power lifters, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. All those yeah. guys are deadlifting 900 pounds plus. They're, they're giants. giants. They're just huge. Yeah. So they're not the sumo deadlifters who are moving the no. bar four and a half right. inches. They're moving 900 pounds. That's right. And actually, inches. that's another, we didn't talk about that, but that's another, that's another thing to think about. The more efficient you are in your deadlift, the more frequency you mm -hmm. can probably pull with. So when you see somebody that yeah. just doesn't move the bar very far or they're a really good sumo deadlifter, which, again, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to knock sumo for th no, for the fine. people who compete, especially it's part of the rules. Like, why would you handicap yourself? Yeah. Um, I've got I've got a guy who's actually on the podcast. Not long. Ago, he was a coach of um, of another client that we interviewed on the podcast. And he he sumo deadlifts this is a little guy. I mean, he's like 200 pounds. He's in Australia. Th the bar literally moves like three and a half inches when he did when he deadlifts. And he deadlifts, you know, the guy is like, a, I think he's like a high 400 pound squatter and he's an 800 pound deadlifter. And I'm talking raw sumo deadlift. Oh it's Lord. crazy. Because, and you just watch it. You're just like, that guy is That's just, sick. his lockout is on his kneecaps. And he and then he has super flexible hips. So he's got a stance where his toes are against yeah. the plates, on the inside of the plates. He sets it down and he's one of those guys and he sets it down, he has to turn his feet back in real fast as he sets the weight down. Because if he's off in a, uh, even a half inch, he's going to smash his toes. <laughs> so I can't. Yeah, I have like a, a mom instinct. It's probably the only mom instinct that I have. And I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> I was watching that the other day and I was thinking to myself, like, are, is that even a legal deadlift? Like, I don't, I need to go back and read the rules. I can't mm. move my feet on a deadlift. I'm a conventional deadlifter. As I set the bar down, I could never move my feet. But I always wonder, like, in a, in a meet, when you watch these sumo deadlifters do that, I need to go back and read the rules. It's probably different per federation but you know their toes are basically touching the plates or just about they start to as they set the bar down mm -hmm. they turn their toes in real fast and so they're actually moving their feet in the middle of the lift so that can't be legal in at least some of the tougher federations i would think yeah i wonder about that so, that's interesting yeah so yeah those are the three primary tracks that i would use to deadlift um i would say this just like mm -hmm. anything else that we where we utilize the minimum effective dose theory of programming, I would never just jump into the DUP high frequency style. Like you can get there over time. Yeah. And I think that most people start in the middle of the bell curve in that sort of block style. And usually that usually starts with intermediate training where you're doing an intensity deadlift day and a volume deadlift day. And then as time goes on, you might move to that intensity and volume on the same day and a supplemental lift on the other day. And as you start to do that, if you're a person who just cannot recover, then you may go swing the pendulum towards the West side style where you do less frequency, higher intensity, lower volume. But as time goes on, if you, if you do well in that block style training, you're like, you know, I think I could actually handle a third deadlift session. Then that's how you would step into that, that role of the, the track of the higher frequency. And that's kind of what we did with you. I think we just mm -hmm. recognized that squats were not providing the stress that you needed to continue to drive strength adaptation because, you know, and you've got some, we've talked about on the podcast where you've got some hip issues and you could, we just couldn't stress your body enough with squats. So we were able to add another, a third session of the deadlift to keep driving that stress and you were able to handle it just fine. Right. That's how I picked the cool. tracks. That's good. Stolen from yeah, the Japanese like public school system. 
Do you think they have a barbell coach track? I doubt it. I don't know. I would guess not. I don't see a lot of... I was going to (laughs) say. It's interesting that... uh, It's interesting some of those East Asian countries that have really picked up on this and they love this style of training. Japan doesn't seem to be one of those. So you see some bodybuilders. You see some bodybuilders, (laughs) but you don't see a lot of Japan. Like like South Korea, you've got some people who are strong in South Korea, right? Singapore, you got some people who are strong in Singapore. China, part of it, I wonder, China is just a talent pool of, you know, 37 billion people. So China has, China yeah. has four times the population of the world in it. It's actually four times the, that's a joke, because they, they couldn't be four times the size. <laughs> but there's a lot of people. So, you know, whatever the thing is, if you're like, oh, you know, how many, how many conjoined twins? Like, boy, there are a lot of Chinese conjoined twins. Well, yeah, there's six billion of them. Mm. So, you know, it's just the, mm-hmm. that you're playing the, it's just the numbers game. So yeah, there's some powerlifters there, but yeah. I don't know. Come on, Japan. We need some more powerlifters coming out of Japan. Yeah, well, what are y'all doing? They're so disciplined. <laughs> You'd think they'd be great. So Good at stretching. Good at stretching. So <laughs> Don't they have a stretch routine that they do before I have work no idea. and during work? And, I'm interested yeah, now. I'm going to so. look it up on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's our story of the deadlift track. So that's how cool. you figure out yeah. what deadlift track is right for you. Anything else? No, those are all my questions. Thanks for letting me ask you all of those on a public no problem. forum. Well, we, we've talked about this a little bit with you um, over time. So I know this wasn't exactly one of those podcasts where you're like, I'm trying to ask questions for a friend, all my friends that listen to the podcast. <laughs> and it's really you. Because we've talked about this before. You know what track you have. You know what track works for you. Yeah in deadlift. And and by the way, I'm actually on the opposite end of the spectrum. I can't deadlift with any freaking... The stronger I get when I come back and I start training and get consistent, I can train with high, relatively high frequency, certainly two times a week, sometimes three times a week. Once I start deadlifting over 600 pounds again, I can have mm. one heavy deadlift session a week. That's it. Now, I can, I can speed pull a little bit on that other session. So I might be pulling 600 or over 600, which is kind of where I'm at now. And then 405 for a few doubles and triples, that's about it for me. And I can't recover. Yeah. I mean, even going down the going down the stairs in the morning, I'm like, Poof, my back is still smoked from two days ago, you know, or putting my tie in my shoes. You know, I bend over. It's not about not being able to breathe. It's my erectors are like, yeah, what are you doing? You know, was, I was like, God, you haven't pulled heavy in three days. What's wrong with you guys back there? They're like, we're old and beat up. Leave us alone. <laughs> So, <laughs> like the opposite of dog. Years. Yes, yes, <laughs> <Just> like, yes. <laughs> Every one day is fifteen That's exactly minutes of recovery. Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so that is another episode of the Barbara Logic Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you like us, if you like Nikki Sims, and you hate me, that's fine. Give Nikki Sims five stars <laughs> on give me five stars. on uh, iTunes or uh, Spotify or I don't know iHeartRadio or Overcast or any of those other places where you can listen to your podcast. Uh, we'd love a five five star review. Uh, gosh, we got a lot of five star reviews. It's awesome. And we're just about to a thousand. Yeah. So a few more would be let's do let's, it. How many I don't know. Are, I need how, to look it up. I'll look it up and then we'll we'll talk about it on the next podcast. Cool. It'll be fun to talk through that. So and this is coming I think we sort of teased out the new technique series was potentially coming out mm. today, the one that you're listening to right now. So for those of you guys that are that are sort of depressed that we didn't come out with the technique series I just had a few more edits I wanted to make, and I wanted to make sure I gave it all the right amount of time. So it will will definitely be out a week from today. So new technique series coming out a week from today. So we'll see you then. And uh, yeah, have a great week, everybody. Have a good one.